Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this crucial discussion here at the World Economic Forum 2024 on transforming energy demand. My name is Tanya Breyer, and I'm an anchor from CNBC, and I'm thrilled to moderate this session this morning. So, you've seen some statistics there on the video. By 2050, estimates indicate that the global economy will have doubled in size and will be serving a population of over 10 billion people. In this context, improving energy efficiency is critical to delivering an affordable, secure and climate-aligned future. Research in the recent white paper, Transforming Energy Demand, published by the World Economic Forum, shows that there are many tangible actions that all businesses can take today to act on energy demand. So what can companies and governments do to enable economic growth through transforming energy demand? Just before we start, I'd just like a few housekeeping points. I'd like to remind you that this session is being live streamed around the world. We have audience members from all over joining us online and of course for you in the room as well. Please remember to use the hashtag WEF24 when sharing any updates on your social media channels. And there will be time later on in this session for your questions. It's now time to introduce my very distinguished panel. Please welcome, right next to me here, Dr. Fatty Birrell, Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Welcome, Fatty. Peter Herwick, Chief Executive Officer, Schneider Electric. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> Dr. Ilham Kadri, Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Executive Committee, Science Co. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Annie Shah, Group Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director, Mahindra Group. And last but not least, bringing up the rear, Bobby Moritz, Global Chair, PwC, United Kingdom. Bob. <laughs> so, Dr. Birrell, what can companies and governments do to enable economic growth? We've just seen at COP28, of course, the pledge by over 120 countries to double the global average annual rate of energy efficiency improvements. Historically, as we were talking before, we've seen a focus on supply but now it's crucial to talk about demand. Why? So first of all, <clears throat> this is a great day. The reason is in Davos, in the World Economic Forum, I think this is the, for me, the 14th year in a row that the energy efficiency takes such a prominent role. The opening day, we have a, a, we have a session on energy efficiency. It is really a dream uh, for the people like uh, me that there is a growing attention on energy efficiency, finally. Yeah. So for us, for many of us, energy efficiency is very important because they are so strong drivers. Very simple. First, if we want to protect the consumers from high energy bill, energy efficiency is a must. You use, as, you use less energy. Second, it is good for your security, energy security for the governments, for the, for the uh, nations to have more secure energy. If you use less energy, you import less energy. Third, for the industries, for their competitiveness. It's a key issue. If an industry, if uh, the uh, uh, company wants to be competitive vis-a-vis -vis the others, you have to reduce the cost of uh, energy and energy efficiency is critical. And fourth is uh, the uh, environmental uh, footprint, uh, climate change. For all these reasons, normally you would think, as the Americans uh, would say, it's a no-brainer, <laughs> uh, but uh, we have not seen enough policy attention and energy efficiency, so as such, today is a very good day. Now, you mentioned the uh, COP28. Mm. Uh, you are right, uh, it is uh, one of the important outcomes of COP28, and we have as International Energy Agency, together working with COP28 presidency, we, have, we made five conditions to consider that the COP28 would be a, a successful one. And one of them was 
doubling the rate of energy uh, efficiency improvement, together with renewable tripling and the others. So uh, more than uh, the 120 countries use it in a separate document, but at the end of the final document, 200 countries sign off. We are committing ourselves, we are making this pledge to double the uh, rate of energy efficiency. This is great. Mm. It's a great news. Of course, we have to see what, we, what come out. So, and the good, another good news is, when we look at the last two years after the, uh, when the, we have the global energy crisis after 24th of February uh, 2021, in the last two years, 75% of the countries around the world strengthen or put new energy efficiency standards. This is excellent news. Mm. It is driven by, I think, the, the governments got it at the end, uh, many governments, that if, if I want to secure my energy system, I have to use less energy plus high energy prices might have been another uh, driver. So what do we need to do now? So first of all, I am a big fan of standards. We have to have standards of the, uh, the equipment we use at home for industry, the, the motors, uh, for the cars and others. There should be standards, first of all, uh, uh, set and then monitored and implemented. This is the first thing uh, first. Second, electrification of our uh, uh, energy system. It is going well for the time being, and I hope it will go better. We are seeing in transportation sector, there is a very strong uh, move. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a colleague from uh, the manufacturing in, uh, car manufacturing industry here. Uh, three years ago, one out of 25 cars sold in the world was electric car, mm. and now it is one out of five cars sold as electric. It is going to grow uh, very strongly. So the uh, heating at home, it is going more and more, uh, the, the, the heat pumps, leaving aside the uh, fossil fuel heaters uh, behind us. And there are many other ways. This is the second one. Standards, electrification. And the third one is the most important one, maybe investments. We need to triple the investment in uh, the energy efficiency uh, measures, which in most cases pay back in two or three years of uh, time. It's a very lucrative business, but the governments need to uh, uh, give the incentives, especially low and mid-income uh, groups, to make the first investment, to buy a heat pump or to have an electric uh, car or, or others. So uh, all in all, I believe there is a new era starting uh, for the acceleration of energy efficiency around the world. We all understood it's a good thing to do, regardless of climate, regardless of something else, just for our pockets, for our energy security, and also uh, remain competitive. The, uh, the companies, to finish with the companies, the companies who do not uh, put enough emphasis on energy efficiency will be less competitive vis-a-vis -vis others. This is a real fact now. How fast can these actions be implemented, do you think, Peter, the ones that Patty's talking about? Well, you know, I think the time is uh, now to do it, and technology today is available. Uh, to take out 70% of the CO2 emissions with today's technology. Let's put this a little bit into uh, perspective. 80% uh, of the carbon generation is related to energy. 30% in buildings, 30% in infrastructure and industry, and 30% in transportation, and then a little bit of the rest. Now, if we look at buildings, uh, for example, since it's a, a third of, of the block, to put it into perspective. You said earlier, until 2050, we have 10 billion people um, on the planet. That's two billion more than we have today. Plus, there are a billion people that don't have access uh, to energy today. We want to bring them also into, into the fold of having access to energy, because it's the passport to a good life. So three billion people that need to put, it will be put into energy at that point in time, and that also need housing. Just to give you an idea, we need to build until 2050 what China has built and what Europe has built just to house these people. Now, all the infrastructure in buildings that are there in Europe, they're going to be there in 2050. We're not going to rip everything down and build it new. So we need to renew what's there, and we need to do it at speed. 
Now, the payback period, and you know, many of us are, are, are business people, so we're worried about the payback period. The payback period of renewing your, your building or your facility can be two to three years. And I want to go all the way down to an example so people can see that it's actually working. We've been working with um, um, a Japanese company in the pharmaceutical space, Takeda, and uh, their facilities in, in Singapore. Uh, we've, um, we've put systems in to understand how the energy is used. We help them to reduce it, to be more efficient. Then, of course, uh, we added also uh, together some uh, solar rooftop to it put a little bit of uh, what's called a microgrid into the building so they can manage their uh, energy today, they're net negative. They're actually furnishing 15% of the energy into the grid, renewable energy into the grid. Of course, you can say, well, they have, uh, they have the luxury of having a big rooftop and a lot of solar. Yeah, that's one solution. But we can talk also about the 600-year-old hotel that we've done in France with, <laughs> with clients. And the payback period, again, two to three years. So the action is now. We need to have governments understand. And also, you know, if there, if there is a good policy to, to, to subsidize, let's, uh, let's do it. Well, when you're discussing the transforming energy demand, Dr. Kadri, with policymakers, mm -hmm. what area do you want help from <laughs> So talking about this energy, I think uh, I want to come back to what was said before, talking about the policymakers. There are three pillars which are really good in the report is save energy, <laughs> don't waste. It's no brainer to take yeah. the American saying. <laughs> Second is energy efficiency and three is value chain partnership. We cannot do it alone. And I represent here the chemical industry, right? So I do whatever Peter says. So on our <laughs> site around the world, I put solar, where uh, our site is blessed with, uh, with solar, et cetera. And indeed, there is efficiency. But in the hard to abate, we have a bigger problem, right, in how to carbonize, de decarbonize our industry. So um, we are doing all of this. We are working on process efficiency, right? Um, I think the energy crisis in Europe was a wake-up call, and we didn't waste this good crisis. We start living with less gas in Europe. We'd, we, we started reimagining our energy input first, right? Going to biomass, looking at other ways of producing steam, um, the excess of energy, like you said, Peter. We, as an industrial leader and player, and we are not an energy maker, we are selling energy into the grid and into the communities, the excess energy. And this is great, while improving the efficiency of our steam operations, up to 5% reduction in every site, just steam. So those are great things. And digitalization, AI, is making the invisible visible in an old industry like the chemical industry, which is great. And that's what we like as leaders, is to see the hidden parts of the iceberg to cut the waste. And if we reuse those byproducts, etc., it's not a waste anymore. So what I tell to the policy makers, we need energy affordable at scale. Um, because I'm not an energy maker, when I'm ready to decarbonize my site, I need it available 24-7, 365 days a year at the right price. In Europe, and we are here in Europe, it's too expensive still. And we know it's not competitive as compared to other regions in the world. I tell them to rethink regulation. I love regulation. It needs to be harmonized, simplified, specifically in the EU. We need unity, not uniformity always, but we need unity. And it's still uh, too long uh, to get a permit. It's, permitting is insane. Two to three years to get just a permit, etc. So we need that. Second, we need uh, reinforce, reinforcement of IP and protection specifically for the good guys who are doing the right thing, we need regulatory recognition. Where is it? From the regulatory point of view, but also link the dots with the investment community to promote the people who are doing the right thing. And the last one, it's scale-up innovation. I think Peter said it very well. Innovations are there. We are scientists. We are bringing those innovations. And, but we don't need anecdotes. We need to sit on critical mass, mainstream, and, and that's why we need regulatory environments, you know, f friendly to business to help us to scale them up 
to be able to go faster in our decarbonization efforts and therefore to make it cheaper and more affordable for many other players. And value chain is important. Small and medium-sized companies are today suffering from those green revolutions which are not easy for them to embark on. So cheaper and making it more affordable are key issues, Dr. Shah. What initial financial sacrifices do companies would have to make to implement these energy demand saving actions? I think it's a myth that you need financial sacrifices for this. And let me start with a dream. What if the world requires less than half the amount of energy it needs today to operate in exactly the same manner that it operates today? This is possible. I represent the Mahindra Group. We operate in 20 industries, from automotive, farm, to real estate, solar, hospitality, and so on. But let me talk about two of our industries that are the most users of energy, auto and farm equipment, or tractors. We began a journey in 2008, and we've been measuring the amount of energy required to produce one automobile or an equivalent unit of automobile, which is how many autos can be produced in 1,000 minutes. Um, and similarly, the am amount of energy required for one unit of tractors. We have a 95% energy productivity in this time period in auto, and 87% in farm. What that means is we have effectively reduced energy usage almost by half. So this is possible. The question is how? And I'd say there are four key th areas that we focused on. One is the simplest one, which is energy efficient equipment. Uh, that's a no-brainer. That, that requires some investment, yes. The second is process changes. And technology today affords a number of different process changes, from the simplest things of if, if you don't need a machine, it turns off automatically, uh, to heat transfers to a number of other areas. The third is supply chain collaboration. Example here is a certain type of paint allows us to use less energy in the paint process. And fourth is a product and design of products. And here I'll take an example on buildings. Uh, we've just launched uh, two residential <coughs> complexes which are net zero. And that's based on the design of the buildings, on how they're positioned, how they use the sunlight, on putting uh, both wind and solar in the buildings, taking energy off the grid, a number of other initiatives where these are net zero residential communities that we've set up. So these are the various actions that can be put together. And what we've seen is that through multiple projects, the payback period is typically 12 to 18 months. So there are no financial sacrifices in doing that. Uh, there is no silver bullet, though. I will not sit here and say that here are three things you can do and this happens overnight. Uh, our team has literally done 3,600 projects in the last 16 years. Uh, we are at a run rate of 300 projects a year. And each project has obviously a small impact, but collectively when you put them together, you see the impact that's far greater. And the question then is how do we scale? And this is where I, I would give a lot of credit to the World Economic Forum in terms of what it's done over the years. Uh, the first Moore's Coalition, discussions like this where we can exchange ideas. Um, one of the initiatives we have is partnering with Johnson Controls now, which has uh, a lot of technology for buildings again, and taking that to everyone in India to say, here's technology that you can use uh, without being commercial on it, and just sharing that best practice uh, in terms of what we've learned. So this is, again, the power of discussions we have in terms of how do we translate that to action on the ground. Bob, how do we translate that to action on the ground? How do you align the public and private sector? So the good news of going last and the bad news of going last is you may run out of time, but you can actually pick up a couple of points along the way and pivot. And I do want to bring a couple of examples to life what my fellow speakers have talked about. So great news that we're having this conversation to raise the awareness. But let's go a little deeper on awareness in our own PwC CEO survey that we launched last night, when we talk about the issue of climate and emissions, 75% of 4,000 CEOs around the world saying they're actually taking action in the energy efficiency space. And the reality is if we are taking those actions, as you just said, we wouldn't be having these conversations if we took the right actions at scale. And that's the real challenge right now. Number two, just to reinforce, if you read the WEF study, and credit to the WEF for pulling this together, 
what we wanted to do is get awareness on the singularity of the issue. And if you go back to some of the major messages coming out of the COP meeting, we had, let's make sure we reduce emissions and think through what I'll call the carbon intensive phase out in terms of what you need to do for energy. You need to increase renewables and you needed to deal with the efficiency point on energy. And we're trying to singularly get some more focus on that last point of the three because the other two have gotten a lot of time and attention recently. Now again, let's take that back to a business perspective for a moment. In most of the organizations that might be in the room here today, you probably have a centralized point of view of where to connect with and ultimately contract to get the supply of energy. You have a decentralized view of how to think about the use and consumption of energy. And that's the major point here. So when we talk about awareness, we're looking to do two things. Create the focal point to say we got to focus on consumption now. And second, awareness of the many different choices of, on the menu of which you can pick many of them, small little ones, that will move the ball forward. And we're looking for incremental savings at scale. So as you go back to what the WEF has done with the IBC, and Peter talked about it previously, it's what can we do now to A, create the awareness, B, can we share more best practices and give people more of a menu of choices to make some decisions on, and these decisions go in the area of savings, which is quick, easy, a decision just needs to be made. It's an operating expenditure. There's other decisions that are more around efficiency that may be CapEx, and you do have to make some investments, but as Peter said, the ROI is almost immediate. And third is how do we actually get the partnerships together? And this goes now to the partnership point. We need partnerships across the sectors and the commercial side because if we come together to share best practice and maybe take action, you actually get an amplifying effect. In fact, we think that's the biggest amplifying effect when you look at what you can do on the savings side versus the efficiency side. And the second piece of that partnership is with governments. And the next phase of work has to be how can we work with governments to say what are the right policy changes to be made to accelerate the curve? We've been talking about some of the policy changes on increasing renewables. Yeah. Now what do we do to actually have the right dialogue on policy changes to enhance the efficiency points? And that's the next phase here that we've got to create awareness for and get some of the G7 and G20 countries really focused on those points. How do you get that collaboration? How do you encourage the public private sector governments to go in the same direction? Look, the reality is you've got a, um, a, a force for change and a force for good that rests in your business community because there's a commercial rationale behind this. Yeah. It, makes, it makes economic sense to yeah. do it. You know, this is what, what Bob said. And one of the points we haven't touched on is the uh, creating visibility. So digitize across your, across your facilities. Uh, you've done it in Mahindra. You know, we've worked with other clients, for example, to, uh, to only understand in all the campuses, all the buildings, all the factories, all, you know, data centers, whatever you have, create visibility at the top floor. How much energy am I using? What type of energy am I using? How much CO2 am I generating? And then task somebody to go deep and get it done. The more important thing, though, if I can, just to pick up on Peter's point, at the COP meeting, we hosted a session, a small group, much smaller than this, where you had a couple of policymakers and a number of business people in the room. And many of them said, we're on this. And we're not. This, let's be honest, we're not at the level of scale and urgency that's needed. And for that matter, for the level of opportunity that exists in the corporates. Because to well, Peter's point, there's bottom line potential here as well. Why did they feel they were on it, though, Bob? because I don't, I'm not aware of all the different choices I have. I'm aware of what I know and what I'm actioning today. There's lots of other things, as Peter and Dr. Shaw said, that we can actually be doing more of. So if we get that competitive uh, sharing together, sharing across the business community and sharing across governments, there's more awareness at a granular level. And now I know what I, is the world of possibilities. I can now start to take those actions. So should I say something? <clears throat> yes, of course. Now, I, I believe the energy efficiency, I mean, everybody, when you go to a meeting, energy meeting, I don't see anybody who would disagree that energy efficiency is a good thing. Everybody says it's a good thing. But it is not moving very fast. What is the reason? First of all, I don't think that the energy efficiency will improve by saying to the people, let's improve the energy efficiency in the television, making the advertisements or in the schools. It can help a bit. 
but it is not the main story. And the companies wouldn't take the energy efficiency measures, make the investments only to, or the mainly I should say, to make a, a public service. They would only do, most of them at least, if they have a commercial interest on that, right. to be very frank on that. So I, with all respect to my colleagues uh, here, so therefore there should be some uh, mechanisms to make sure that the companies, if they put the energy efficiency measures in place, they will have a competitive edge vis-a-vis -vis others. This is number one. Number two, also for the, uh, the consumers, the households and the others, they wouldn't save energy just for the sake of uh, saving energy. There should be, I maybe seem too of a government point of view, but there should be standards. Without standards and norms, this would not work. I'll give you one example. Today, the biggest challenge we are facing in the world in terms of the climate change, most of the emissions come from the power generation. Okay? And when you look at the Asia, you know what is the number one, by far number one driver of uh, uh, power demand? It is by far, it is air conditioners. And they will grow very strongly. Very strong, the air conditioners. And when you look at the Asian countries, developing Asian countries, the amount of energy you need, you need for an air conditioner to provide the same comfort compared to Japan, you need three times more electricity because they are inefficient. If they hit the standards like Japan, the Asian developing countries, for example, they would need less electricity and we would need to build less power plants and therefore there will be less problem of climate change and others. And also we keep the money in the pocket. So therefore, two things, there should be a commercial interest and the second, there should be standards put set by the governments and they should be reinforced and implemented. Fatty, what if the governments change and what if you have governments let's say, the, the change that are not supportive of these kind of policies? Yes. I think we have to make the governments understand that, A, if they do that, it is good for their budget. Okay? They, 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 they will save money. Good for their uh, the security, the energy security, national security, and uh, good for their carbon footprint. Some governments don't get it. Some governments get it, but the energy efficiency is a complicated business. You have to coordinate it among the different ministries. It is not only energy ministry, it's energy ministry, finance ministry, the, the industry uh, ministry. You have to have a coordination and you have to get the coordination uh, done. It is the reason why we are working many governments around the world. We brought about 60 uh, governments uh, last year in, in Paris, in, in Versailles, to give them the guidance there. And it is a reason many governments are picking up and putting new standards and norms and they are uh, following it because they understood that it is not for the sake of the world, for dreams and utopia and everything. It is for real life. It will be better for their budget. It will be better for their energy security and better for their uh, carbon footprint. So this is, the, this is the issue and I see that the, the change in the last two years, as I mentioned, 75% of the countries put new energy efficiency standards or strengthen them is a result of two things. We and the others pushing it very strongly and the second high energy prices because there is a, a driver there too. Yeah, of course. Don't I think there is a big elephant in the room called competitiveness. <laughs> Um, and with all of this, I think we are, we have great examples, industrial examples. We are ready as uh, innovators, right, to provide solutions to um, decarbonization. Uh, but competitiveness is important. And when you have energy prices which are four times yeah. higher in Europe than in other places in the world, there are many people in the industry value chain, chemical industry value chain I represent here, who are suffering. And when we say energy savings, let's put it right. We will not be winning by decreasing the carbon footprints and saving energy by decreasing the industrial output. This is called industrial suicide. We need to do more with less when we, when we will continue industrially producing, right? Creating jobs. 
creating an environment which is business friendly. So I think that's the big, for me, big question. Therefore, we need to create also demand for those new innovations, right? And the demands come, ScienceCo is a leading actor in batteries, but without charging station, enough charging stations, the end user, you are not gonna buy an EV or hybrid car, right? So we need those charging stations. We need an infrastructure to promote our clean mobility solutions, right? And accelerate them to cannibalize our own business and allow the world to turn more greener, but with affordability in mind. So I think that's, for me, important. Keep competitiveness in mind. All the regions in the world are not equal. Europe is not a fossil fuel region, right? And it will never be. And in our, of, of course, we are cleaning our home, looking at electrifying our processes as much as we can, moving from coal to gas, by the way, <laughs> which is good. And whenever we can move to biomass, we do it as well. But we need here policymakers and authorities to support us with the ecosystem to make it plug and play. Because the hard to abate, the heavy industry, this is where we can have the highest impact. Dr. Shah, can I ask you about emerging markets and developing economies facing the largest increases in energy demand? Can these economies follow the same pace of change as developed countries, do you think? I think the developing countries can actually create a better set of outcomes, and India is leading that today. Uh, even if you look at renewable energy, uh, India is putting in 500 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030. Uh, the beauty there is that the cost of solar energy in India is far lower than traditional energy. And uh, we've run a solar business, and we're moving all our plants now with captive solar energy. We can set up a captive plant in one part of the country and have it transmit over the grid wherever you want. And uh, it's a 30 to 40 percent saving in energy, so it's a no-brainer. Coming back to what you said earlier, uh, for companies to come in and, and do that. So I think emerging countries are going to, in some ways, show the way and rewrite the rules in terms of how energy can be used. But if we go back to the earlier discussion, this is not, in my view, about regulatory. I do agree that standards will help, and especially air conditioners is a great example. But this is a very different problem than what we see in the rest of energy issues. The reason for that is, one, everyone agrees that we'd love to spend less energy to produce the same set of things. There is no debate on that. That that's, makes us more competitive, that's commercial for us, et cetera. The question is how? And here I go back to my earlier point, which is there is no easy answer. So it's not for CEOs to come in and say, I'm going to focus on this one project, make this project work, and that's my solution. It's about getting the entire organization committed to it, because that's where the results are going to come. And unless that culture change is driven across the organization, I go back to what Bob was saying about best practice sharing, and show them here are things that you can do. That's where the difficulty comes in. Yeah. Right? There isn't something I can show in the next three months that I've got an answer on this, I've solved this problem. Right? It's a long-term problem we have to solve. Yeah, just you, can, something. Yeah. You, uh, you made in India a very good thing, LED lighting. That's right. This is a huge program, LED lighting, and we are taking it as a best practice and we went to Indonesia. Because in the energy efficiency, it is, uh, unlike the other parts of the energy sector, it is much easier to share the best practices because they are not very different from, from each other. It, is, it can be lighting, it can be the, uh, the air conditions, it can be the uh, cars, uh, the uh, standards for the cars and others. So therefore, the, what India has done and LED lighting is an excellent example to be shared as a best practice with the rest of the world. And it is not only, it doesn't need to come only from the mm. developed countries to developing countries. It can go from a developing countries to another developing countries if it's a successful one. In my view, it's a very successful one, the LED lighting you have achieved there. Yeah, that, that's exactly me, right. And I would just add to it, which is, as you talked about what can governments do, right? the government in India is proactively pushing Yes. climate change in a very big way. Right? I represent FIKI, which is one of India's oldest and largest um, industry associations. <clears throat> and in discussions with the government, they're actually pushing industry to actually do a lot more, a lot faster. Peter, but, I know you want yeah. to uh, I, I wanted to come back to the white paper that we've done together with the WEF, uh, because uh, we've deliberately picked 
quite a few examples, and I think it's about these examples. It's a very complex environment, whether it, you know air conditioning in building, building management system, you know efficient pumps that ought to be used in uh, in buildings and so forth. In the manufacturing environment, is again different whether you have hard to abate and you don't have enough electricity to substitute um, a steam process with mm -hmm. electricity. Uh, when, you, when you go into light manufacturing, it's a, it's a different story. You go into a data center. Uh, these are, to a large extent, uh, carbon neutral uh, today, and there is some work to be done mm -hmm. uh, even, uh, even more. So we pick these examples in the white paper, and I invite everybody um, who, who has the power to make change to read some of those, and we will come out with, um, with you know, lighthouse examples so we, we can share, and it's not about who has done what, but what's possible. Practical examples. I'd now like to open up questions. Yes, sir, and if I can ask you to keep your question short and keep it as a question, not a commentary, and introduce yourself as well. Thank you so much, sir, you're first. Hey, thank you indeed. Uh, I'm Kai Mykkänen, uh, Minister of Energy and Environment, uh, Finland, which is a small but energy intensive country. And uh, we had last year actually already 94% uh, fossil free electricity and we've decreased emissions by almost 90% since uh, 2010. The problem is uh, seasonality. We had last year 467 hours of negative electricity price. So more than 19 days in a row, if you put it. But on the other hand, two weeks ago, we had a day where we were having two euros per <coughs> kilowatt hour for almost whole day. And uh, my question for you is that how you see this balancing, balancing challenge that is, it, is the result or the answer more from the demand side that do we see potential for, for example, buildings or electric vehicles taking the largest part of the uh, demand response and, and, and balancing uh, challenge, or does this mean that we actually need clean base load as nuclear, we need flexible uh, weather independent energy, not only wind and solar, because this is what we are now considering heavily, and of course we try to solve with all these angles, but you can now give your wise advice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Biran, now you want to answer. So what you can uh, do is uh, in uh, Finland or the countries like that, uh, there are three uh, areas. One, uh, demand side response, and this is more the uh, uh, making sure uh, that in the difficult times, the efficiency measures come in place. This can be as a result of, again, standard norms or a different type of pricing of uh, electricity. And the second one is, in addition to the, uh, to the renewables, it is important to have uh, the, the hydropower or nuclear power uh, in the mix. And I believe with the increasing share of uh, uh, renewables and in the countries where there's a seasonality issue, nuclear power can play an important role. And this is the reason why we are seeing uh, around the world uh, nuclear power is making a strong yeah. comeback. Absolutely. The, the um, uh, of course, I think the investment needs to go largely all uh, into the into the grid to to understand who are the the main consumers, and then as you walk down in in the grid, you you come to uh, be it campuses or you come to um, large industrials or you come uh, to to users that can actually fluctuate the um, uh, the energy that they that they need. Good example are, for example, also data centers that do um, uh, AI modeling because they don't need exactly the same power over time. They can go up and down. But those, that requires contracts between uh, the generation unit and, and the user. And the demand response can be fully digitized. So it, you, know, you have one of the most complex problems at the, at the end of the day. But you, it's good that we have countries that are so far in the renewable space. Now, um, how much can we shape off the peaks and fill the troughs? That's the next challenge to have. And I think digitization of the grid into the microgrid, into the big users, uh, will help to, uh, to do it. One point that we can't forget is today we are so focused on energy consumption, the, the dialogues that we're having, on what I'll call the traditional energy sources. We have to be equally as focused on reduction and efficiency and savings of the renewable energy sources to avoid, again, a repeat of the same problem. 
because right now we still don't have enough supply around the world on the renewable side to deal with this issue. So we actually have to be smart on both. And I don't want to have us focus just on one side or the other. It's a broader mm. energy efficient point that we should be talking about. Let's just take another question. We have time for one more. We have another question from our audience. Yes. Thank you. If you could introduce yourself, thank you. Idris Kipari from Turkey, uh, IDEM Energy Group's uh, CEO. When the renewable investments certainly are capex intensive, front loaded mm. investments that required significant financing. And the financing certainly during the last few years has been both expensive and inaccessible to many countries. To have the infra infrastructure to make them more efficient is one thing that requires sometimes little or no money and several hundreds of projects to make it more efficient. It looks good for the leaders. But to actually undertake an investment of you know, the billions of dollars, you need the counterparties that actually we, that are going to take the risk of the country that you are going to build the renewables or the nuclear so forth. And for Turkey, it has been really challenging in the, during the last four or five years. But at the end, as Mr. Birol commonly says, that we live in the same environment, like to solve one country's environmental issue and to make it better does not help so long as you don't actually distribute the same way to entire globe. So how can the emerging market countries have access to finance at a reasonable cost because it's good for everyone mm. and uh, who can actually undertake this? And MLA is one of them that I know, but I think it's not, uh, at the end, is not enough. And uh, given the cost of financing for the banks, it's not lucrative enough. How can we solve the issue for the emerging countries to, to do, the, especially the renewable investments. Thank you for your question, Thanks. Dr. Shah. So let me share our story in renewables. Uh, three years ago, we were looking at a renewables business with a dilemma. Should we expand or should we sell the business? And the reason for that is to meet the goals for India. We needed somewhere between five to $10 billion of long-term capital if we were to stay in the renewables business. And what helped was first a set of regulations that enable projects to work efficiently over 25 years. Second was market mechanisms to create an investment structure, uh, an invit that allowed us to attract capital from sources around the world. We just listed that invit yesterday. And uh, we have all the capital that we need and more. We had to tell a lot of investors, sorry, we don't need more capital anymore. Uh, so, Capital is there. If you've got the right market mechanisms around it, if the projects work, if you can show the returns over time, and you have the regulatory framework to make it happen, capital is there. May I just say one thing? Yes, sir. So I think uh, the COP28, we started with COP28. Uh, there were many, many good uh, outcomes, such as the tripling of the renewable uh, efficiency, doubling of uh, tripling of the renewables doubling of energy efficiency, methane reduction, moving away from fossil fuels. But one thing I wish it came out, it didn't come stronger. Maybe it is for uh, Baku now in Azerbaijan, uh, we will have it. Namely, how we are going to finance the clean energy investment in emerging and developing countries. This is the key issue. Many countries work for COP28, many colleagues are here. I see the Norwegian uh, minister who is one of the architects of, of it. So they have very good results, but this is the main thing left. And it is uh, the, when we look at the last five years, clean energy investment increased from one trillion to $1.8 trillion, big increase, whereas the fossil fuel investments remain the same. But the problem is all of this increase came from the advanced economies and China. What about the rest? So we need everybody to be on board. So therefore, it would be great if we, the next uh, COP, COP29 in Baku, can have a look at this 
missing bit and which means for me the fault line of our fight against climate change and the how we are going to support the emerging and developing countries for clean energy investments. Dr. Biro, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'd just like a very brief closing remark from each of you. With everything going on in our world, with all the geopolitical crises, economic headwinds, how do we keep this topic as a priority? What is your message? Bob, I'll start with you. It's a fairly simple one. Read the report. 30% savings on the energy usage. $2 trillion of savings from an economic commercial perspective. And that gets to your competitive point. Thank you. Dr. Shah. I think there's a very strong commercial argument to save energy. It's just about how we do it. And this is where working together as a group to share best practices is going to enable us to get there. Dr. Kadri. Innovation is there. Ingenuity is there. Uh, we can do it. We cannot do it alone. So let's do it together. Peter. Time is now. It makes economic sense to do it. Solutions are available. I uh, echo Bob, read the report. So, oh, I wouldn't say read the report because there are so many <laughs> So what I would say is that let's trust the people in terms of saving the energy, but not so much. Uh, let's make the standards and the regulations ready so that uh, we move in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Perfect.